Telephone time. Telephone time with the stories of John Nesbitt. And now, John Nesbitt. Some of this story might be found in the advertising section of the daily newspapers, but most of it happened to come to me from a boy with whom I went to school in Piedmont, California many years ago. We met together as grown men on a San Francisco ferry boat, and as we crossed the bay, I happened to hear one of those personal accounts that I like to collect as men who never made a headline. Now, I'm going to start out with some of the actual articles which we like to use as clues in the building of a story. The principal clue in this case is this stack of books. It's the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's much beaten up and it has a couple of volumes missing, which you will learn more about later on. A different kind of document is this death certificate. It was issued during the influenza epidemic which followed the First World War. And the remaining clues in this case are this Reuters cap and a college diploma. Now all of these articles belonged to a junk man. And as sometimes seems right when you're telling private family history, only the names will be changed. And I'm going to try to relate this story just about as the junk man's son, Alex Seminian, told it to me. This heap of rusting scrap metal looked like a treasure to Jules Seminian, who arrived here in 1918, for he had been a peddler in the old land, and the salvaging of junk was to him the most ancient and respectable of occupations. The brass bed might qualify as junk, but when his first employer bestowed it upon him, to Jules it seemed beyond belief that he might have it. It will become his young wife's deathbed, but now it is simply a glittering property for a man awaiting the arrival of a family. This is a fine house you have given us for no rent, Mr. Constantine. I thank you. And my wife will thank you, too, when she comes from the old country with our two little baby boys. Excuse. Jay Seminian talking. Yes, I will look at this stuff. No, no. You bring this stuff over to our yard. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Well, I thank you very much. Hey, goodbye. My cousin, it is not our junkyard, it is my junkyard. Oh, aren't they unbelievable? The ins Encyclopedia Britannica. Ah, and what a bargain. I got the whole bunch for only one dollar. My sons will learn all that is printed here. One hundred percent of the knowledge of the world. Ninety percent. Ninety? Volumes eight and fourteen are missing. Two? Are you sure? Certainly I am sure. I can read. Ten days after the joyful family reunion, he stands there, a frantic, terrified man, the infants crying lustily for feeding, and in the proud brass bed, the mother who can no longer hear that call. Are they not wonderful babies? See how they stop crying so they will not disturb their mama. Just think how smart they are. You will understand, will you not? That I am feeding them just like you want me to. Don't you worry, my pretty. I will take very good care of them. And Philip shall be your eyes. And Alexander, your soft, 
محیط محف مستر کانسٹنٹین وہی ہو ایسا نیم آف گاڈ کم ان اوائکن ہر From this moment, he poured his loneliness into making the junkyard a success, toiling just as if he blamed his poverty for the mother's loss. the startled Mr. Constantine began to recognize he'd found his master in the arts of converting junk to gold. So the bank account grew, and yet it remained his chief delight to prepare the children's food and fill the mother's role, perhaps his loving error of ownership beginning then. But to Philip there and Alex, these were the happiest times together. sons. Tonight the dishes can wait. It is time that we make use of the words that the public schools teach you to read. Now before your mama bring you over from the old country, I bought you these wonderful books so that you will not grow up so ignorant as papa. You will take turns reading them until you have learned the knowledge of the world. All but a little ten per se. The Encyclopedia, Britannica, a dictionary of arts, sciences, literature, and general information. Jackson, Andrew. Seventh President of the United States. Protoplasm, the name given to a substance composing traffic, the capital of a department of the same name. He was fond of saying that when a man spends next to nothing, he can afford to be rich. What he really meant was that for the boys, he would always afford nothing but the best. And a fashionable academy was his first surprise. Well. Here we are. Now, instead of foreign accents and junk, a military academy with uniforms and riding horses and table manners. But, Father, why do we have to leave home? Oh, you must understand, my little boys. A junkyard is good enough for Papa, but not for you. In the academy here, you will be educated. You will live like princes. You will be Americans. How do you do? I'm Major Bowles. I hope you found everything satisfactory. Oh, uh, Jay Staminian. And these are my two wonderful little boys whom you will educate. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I brought their tuition. A one thousand dollars. <laughs> the two small Saminians drilled earnestly on the parade ground and they plugged away at class for honors, not knowing they shared their father's drive to find success. And now the final freshman class awards for scholarship in English literature and Latin go to cadets Alexander and Philip Saminian. Bravo! Bravo! <laughs> <laughs> J. Seminian, highest prices paid, you call, we haul. J. Seminian now at three locations. The golden junk man, unbelievable but true. While by the time the boys had reached their graduation ball, they were, as Alex said, finally sold on the idea that they were a couple of little princes. The truth being, as Alex also noted, 
they had become a couple of little four-letter words, but call it snob. You dance beautifully, Alice. Oh, me, I got two left feet. Oh, <laughs> listen to your modest brother, Philip. Oh, well, you don't study here, so it hasn't gotten around to you yet, but modesty is a very Semenian trait. Oh, everybody here can tell you it's very, very Semenian. Phil, not here, huh? And talking of Semenian traits, have you seen Dad's latest thing? Cut it out, Phil. This is not oh, funny. Now, they've got to see it sooner or later. Everybody has. Golden Junk Man. Unbelievable, but true, that at every one of my 12 locations, I am celebrating my 16th year as the Golden Junk Man. And this house was his great surprise when they went home for the last summer before college. All this to do them proud, they realized, except that now it seemed only gaudy and vulgar. Two adolescents trapped in a world in which they felt quite certain they never would belong. When does the auction start? Hey, shut up, he's coming. <laughs> Alex Alexander uh, and Philip Saminian. Jay Saminian talking. <laughs> well, how do you like your new furniture? Is it not unbelievable? Yes. <laughs> Imagine, both of my boys graduating from military school with honors, both, and in the fall, college. And look, for study, now that my boys are home to live again, and see these, almost like new. Come on, try them. And look at these beautiful desks. What a history behind them. <laughs> hey, hey, direct from the opera company that went broke because the manager ran away with the money. Also, the fat primi dollar. <laughs> Dad. Dad, look, there's something I want to talk to you about later. What is the use of waiting? Later, Phil, later. There is something? Oh, this is nothing, Dad. What is the use of waiting, Alex? He's got to know. Now, Dad, we'd like to stay at college for a while, be on our own. I'll tell everything. Oh, well, that, that's all that there is, Dad. It's not all. Tell it, Philip. Tell it. All right. If you must know, we can't live in this museum. We're sick of your newspaper ads, of being laughed at. The way you act, Dad, like a... Peddler! That's enough, Phil! Dad, it's, it's... It's what our friends think. Your friends? When did you ever invite even one of your friends to our house? When did you ever do anything but make a thousand excuses? I get you all these rich things. I count the hours till you come home. I work. Day and night for you. That's just it, Dan. You're smothering us. I should die. I should die before I make you ashamed of me. I've had enough. And you, my son Alexander, have you also had enough? Or would you like to see what an ignorant, dirty peddler your father really is? Dad, Dad, please. Can I show you? I'll show you! As Alex remembered it, the chief reason they went off to State University was just because father had considered Colton College the more exclusive. Plugging at the homework hard as ever, finding it good standing alone and all that, not finding it so good when they thought of the bitter look in their father's eyes. Forgive me for intruding, Mr. Saminian, but I had to come. You are welcome, cousin. Welcome. Hey, sit down right there. I can stay only a moment. Today I received a letter from your sons. Oh. How are they? Well. Do they like college? Do they need anything? They ask why you do not answer their letters. I got nothing to say to them. Excuse me, Mr. Saminian. 
But it is you who are to blame. You who forced them to become educated gentlemen. While I remained an ignorant peddler, because of my ambition for them, there has come this great ditch between us. This... They can never cross back to me again. Tell me, my cousin, if you were me, what would you do? If I were you, I would not find myself in such a predicament in the first place. So, you have a big brain. But where is your junkyard? I own it, and 20 more like it. I, Jay Saminian. So, where are your sons, Jay Saminian? But don't worry. Jay Saminian hadn't run a single pile of scrap iron into 20 locations by wandering around in a daze very much of his life. He was able to study, it seems, by photographing whole paragraphs at a time on his memory. And he could very soon quote you anything from the second law of thermodynamics to the third wife of Henry VIII. And that autumn, among the freshmen lining up to register at exclusive Colton College was Jay Seminian in person, who had passed the college board exams in one triumphant sweep. But during the first day at Colton, he often said that he felt like Methuselah muscling in on a kindergarten party. The good location for school, lots of students. And in spite of his fabulous memory for print, in class at first, he had great difficulty in trying to learn by ear. So the faculty of Colton College was somewhat of a problem for him, when he wasn't something of a problem for the faculty of Colton College and stating that these are the facts. If the professor will excuse me. I am sure the professor will correct my ignorance. I know that the professor is right. Of course the professor is right. But in that case, in volume one, page 192, Encyclopedia Britannica, is a mistake. <laughs> on the bottom of the page. <laughs> Later, Sumenian. Oh, uh, Sumenian, I should like a word with you before you go. Class dismissed. Don't worry. Professor Scott, I am very sorry. I apologize. A student should not correct his professor in class. Can you hear anything? I wonder what's going to happen to the poor guy. I told him to stop correcting the professors. I told him he'd get into trouble. Did he raise the roof with you, Saminian? Oh, what do you care? You were right. I think he was mean to ball you out. What happened? He told me they promote me to, to sophomore. Already? Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, But to the end of his life, he was the most fanatical rooter that Colton ever had. At the annual big game with State, he would shake the stand, shouting that Colton players were gentlemen of honor and the State team was beyond contempt. Jewel's word in his old-fashioned slang being that they were no good bozos. All right, ready. One, two, three, down. Ready. One, two, three, up. Although Jules did baffle up the rooting cards, he mastered about everything else. 70 hours of classroom and study each week, two calendar years only, special examinations for him, and the three Seminians were about to meet again. Well, what's wrong, Seminian? I am finished, Professor. Well, but you have two hours yet. I know. 
But I am finished. Well, don't you want to use the time to check your answers? Excuse me, Professor, but I think they are right. Yeah. Yes, I imagine they are. And up at State, two juniors received a visit from Mr. Constantine, now in his most solemn way, stage managing the final act of an original Jasominian production. Mr. Constantine! Hi, Mr. Constantine. Why don't you tell us you were coming down? Hello, boys. Say, uh, nothing's wrong with Dad, is it? Oh, no, no, no. I just left him. Oh, well, he's back. Is, is he all right? <laughs> you would not recognize him. I come because I want you to do something for me. And no questions asked, no explanations, yes? Yes, if you like. I want you should come with me tomorrow night. Well, what are we... No questions, please. A favor, I ask. Well, sure, of course. I pick you up at six tomorrow night. At six? Tomorrow night. Okay, Mr. Constantine. <laughs> I telephone you before I come. Okay. Goodbye. Could it be something to do with Dad, Phil? Oh, I don't know. I hope he's all right. It's been two years since we've seen him. Yeah, well... You know, I miss the old guy, too. Visitors from state moving through the shadows toward the faculty club of Colton and inside a dean saying astounding things about a father. A special ceremony to present him with a diploma. Students and pretty co-eds sitting there like old friends. And the two young Semenians not looking at each other and hiding a little terror as to what a father might say. Forgetting for this moment that it was only their achievements that had ever brought from him the too loud and too noisy shout of triumph. I want to thank all of you for this great honor. And I especially want to thank my professors who put up with a comical student who came into their classrooms <laughs> with an encyclopedia in their head. I came here because I was the father who lost his two sons. I thought that this was all I would need to reach them. I thought I would say, well, what do you think of me now, huh? <laughs> Jay Seminian, the biggest junk man in this whole state. And now, a Bachelor of Arts like you. But I was wrong. You showed me. You took me into your hearts and gave me a part in your world, your young world. You helped me to understand my two sons. If I can reach them, it's because of you. And now you must excuse a very middle-aged fellow student for thinking that you're much too young to know how beautiful you are. And as for my two boys, who are sometimes troubled about their father making a fool of himself, I, I say this. I wouldn't let a couple of bozos from another school <laughs> Like me. <laughs> I must tell you that the volumes of the Britannica we used here are replicas and are not the originals which were used by Jules, much as I wanted to have them. I did write to Alex asking to borrow them. Only then did I learn that Jules himself had done all of us out of taking any souvenirs. This is what Alex wrote. One morning after his college career closed, father calmly bundled up his old set and along with a used bookcase, sold it for a couple of dollars. 
which figures out over 20 years to just a 100% profit, doesn't it? I saw the golden junk man only once when I was a fourth grader in the school we showed you. And at that age, of course, I thought he was merely funny. So I was glad that I met Alex on the ferry boat shortly after his father had passed away and learned then that after all, no man's life is merely amusing. And now we're going to have the clues for the story to come. We obtained an old set of razors from the time when a man liked to have a blade for each day of the week. And a story came from them because a man decided not to use these regularly, but to grow a beard. When you break a law, you may get off, but when you break a fashion, you can't escape. And so these razors led us to the case of a man and his beard. So until next week, when we meet again for another story, good evening. Thank you.